We are in the midst of a fascinating and detailed discussion by Sri Aurobindo of the planes of our existence where starting from first principles Sri Aurobindo describes how reality is experienced in planes of consciousness gradations or layers of consciousness, each of which represents a particular quality and relationship between the observing Purusha and the energy of the soul that is what we call life or Prakriti. He describes in detail the nature of the material world where the soul or the individual Purusha consciousness is entirely wrapped around and overwhelmed by the material form and density of nature. To the extent that the soul feels itself almost a product of the matter and process of nature. We feel when in identified with the body that we live because our heart beats. We think because our brain has ripples of electricity and if somehow this body were removed, we would cease to be. We feel that we begin with the body and we end with the body and so on. The sense of I is almost entirely as if a product of the processes of nature, of material nature. But then, in this he goes in great detail describing what makes us incapable of experiencing life fully, incapable of even having a clear awareness of mind, because everything is bound by and held by the dullness of material substance and even it prevents us from entering into true relation with other beings or other objects. You cannot, for example, know the flower unless you have some mechanism of relating to it through your senses, through the touch, through the sight and even these are dependent on the material process. If your organs of sight are damaged, you cannot see. And therefore, our relationships with everything in the world are fragmented. Everything appears to be separate, different and cut off. And all of these things are specific to the material world and our experience in it when identified with the body. And separate from this is the domain which he has described as the life world or the vital world where the consciousness of Purusha is of the nature of vital awareness 
and the world itself is vital energy life force everything is energy and force of energy working unlike the physical world the energies pass right through everything the energy of the flower sitting there in the vase even if i do not see it or consciously relate to it its energy flows right through me and influences me if you live in a room where there are plants which are kept even if you were blind the effect of the energy of the plants would pass right through you change your state of energy change your state of mind even and even your physical biological health what is outside this room beyond the walls which i cannot see still passes right through energetically and so the vital world unlike the physical is a world of continuities of flows of energy being therefore not rigidly bound to form it is fluid but being fluid it also allows for more fluid distinctions of even energies so there are as if multiple gradations within the vital world we experience in our own consciousness shifts of energy or grade of energy i am now in a state of dull heavy energy or i shift into bright clear energy and innumerable almost an infinite gradations of qualitative shifts of energy a mood of happiness a mood of sadness a mood of quiet stillness a mood of agitation and all of these variations make for their own distinctive experiences of the vital world and the world itself is now a complex mix of so many different gradations further he points out how the character of the vital world is primarily a drive of desire satisfaction of impulse and therefore he calls it desire world and it's it has much greater freedom than the physical world because things can flow easily and yet the very nature of desire binds you and traps you and as a result the world is split into extremes of happiness and joys and on the side sadnesses and sufferings which makes for the ranges of high heavens and the lower hells and the whole range is belonging to the vital worlds when freed from the gross physical body that is our first experience being in a domain close to matter but of a vital character and then we can span through the ranges of the vital worlds the transitions which are documented in so many traditions of the soul journeying after death through hells heavens or whatever variations but all of these sri aurobindo says is the a realm of power energy and force therefore the character of the vital is always exaggeration dramatization of uh, strong impulsiveness in the material world whenever you have an experience of that kind you can be sure it is vital it is not essentially spiritual or even mental for that matter in fact you will notice in the current age people are as if normally tuned in to the state of excitation of dramatization aggrandization much of this you will find emerges from but it's not limited to the culture of hollywood where the aggrandization somehow and the attractiveness has been turned into a science and an art to such a degree that it has mesmerized the whole world and as a result the character of the modern age or culture of the modern age is largely vital and so in a vital culture one tends also to value spirituality in terms of its vital effects and we find often in the new age culture even though they use words of spirituality the evidence of something being spiritual is often a vital phenomena somebody materialized an object oh he must be spiritually great somebody created an experience which was dramatic which was powerful it was overwhelming i went there and i was so overwhelmed and that must be great spiritual power 
So in some interactions which I had in Europe recently, I asked this question, why every time you say, it was very powerful, it was powerful, it was great, why don't you ever look at, was it pure? Was it uplifting? Did it bring clarity and depth of quality of consciousness? And nobody values those things anymore because the culture has become of aggrandizement and dramatization. But in fact, this is the character of the vital and because it is an energy of attraction, of desire, it is so seductive. It can sway entire cultures or civilizations into its ambit. And that's what we see today in a large part of the globalized culture. Of course, at some point, the inner spirit says, I'm tired of this. Now I want something which is deeply satisfying, something which gives me calm and peace and I'm tired of excitations, which often happens at a later age when the system is exhausted and the nerves are unable to take in too much of intensity. Then you start looking for something deeper. But even those deeper things can belong to the vital worlds because in the vital worlds also there are gigantic realms of intense, powerful um, calm, but of a vital calm. And that can give you rest, but it will not give you the deep satisfaction. So somewhere along the way, we have to awaken to the deeper sensitivities of the psychic being, the soul within, or some higher intuitive perception which says, yes, this is nice, but it's missing the real thing. And if we have not developed that, one can easily get swayed by appearances, pretentious and even dramatic and impressive forms in which th uh, the vital world can clothe itself as if to imitate spirituality. One of the forms you will see everywhere in the world today is if you want to be a successful guru or spiritual um, preceptor or teacher of whatever kind, you have to say, I'm not a guru. There was a time when it was acceptable to say, I'm a guru, and people followed you. Now if you say, I'm a guru, people don't trust you. So you say, I'm not a guru. And say, people say, see, he's genuinely spiritual because he says, I'm not a guru. And you have to kind of cut through appearances because all appearances can be pretended. Go to what it is that is taught. Go to what that represents, either the individual or the movement or the teaching. In what part within you does it resonate? And unless it resonates deeply at the level of the most deep part of your soul, you do not accept or accept only provisionally waiting for a deeper conviction. And those who have not developed that or have lost that contact are the ones who first get misled most easily. And the world is becoming largely because of the domination of this vital culture, largely full of deceptive forms. I've touched upon this in some detail, uh, but Sri Aurobindo describes the characteristics of the vital world and then he describes the relationship between the vital and the physical. And the most important part of that relationship is the physical world itself, he says, is as if a projection from the vital as if the vital has thrown out of itself a coarse, dense part separating from it to create the physical world. And life on earth is the result of the pressure of the vital world pushing now on the physical world, which is its own expulsion. And the life world is constantly acting upon things of the physical world. Influences are pouring in, producing their results and going right back to the vital, flowing back through the physical and the vital. And within us, the desire part, whatever part within us feels desires, is under constant influence of this life world. He moreover points out that in nature, there are no hard gaps, hard divisions. So the vital world as if penetrates all the way down into the physical and also rises above towards the mental. And just as the physical world in its heights tends towards the vital and the mental, making for a pretty complex mix 
of gradations and combinations of influence. He then also points out that in the vital worlds there are beings on each of these gradations, each fulfilling that particular quality of consciousness of its level. And many of them turn to the physical world as part of their interest, otherwise they are busy in their own world. Some turn to the physical and human beings turn to them, which makes for an interesting connection. And a lot of what is passing under the domain of occultism really is building on these relationships to produce actions in the physical which are projections from the vital and often from the beings of the vital world. He explains also that a lot of this knowledge of the interrelation between the physical and the vital is lost in confusion, in ignorance and uh, false explanation which has led to what today we call superstitions of the past. But in fact behind these superstitions are deep truths and principles which have to be recovered by a future science which is not so obsessively fixed on the material world. In the paragraph we have just completed, which is the next paragraph here, Sri Aurobindo explains why we are unable to experience all this or we are not conscious of all this. Because, he says, it is not through the physical body and the physical senses that the vital world impacts on us. It impacts on us through the vital body of which we are not normally conscious or the mental body of which we are not conscious. In the yoga tradition, they speak of five bodies of which we are conscious only of three, the physical, the vital and the mental, kosha, sheaths, which are interconnected through the centers which we discussed in great detail last time of the chakras and the marmas of which we spoke of and through this intermingling of the three bodies we have the experience of a thinking living body. But our thinking and living parts are really the physical body turning to life and to mind. So he uses this vocabulary of the physical mind and the vital, sorry, the physical vitality and the physical mind. So our life force is really inside the body, the emergence of life energy, inside the body, emergence of mind is what we are conscious of. But we are not conscious of our vital body proper and our mental body proper, which actually connect to the vital worlds and the mental worlds and through them, all those influences pour into us and through those bodies also we exercise an influence in those domains of which we are not normally conscious. But he says, by self-development we can become aware of them, of these vital and mental bodies, possess our life in them. Right now we are not possessing, we are only possessing our physical life. We can awake in them and seize that awareness become conscious there and get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds and also use them to better experience more completely even physical worlds, physical things. So we saw some of this in great detail last time. Even looking at the flower, you would experience not just its physical form and perfume and color, but its quality of vital energy, the aura as they describe, or even its mental or psychic consciousness. And that you would experience even at a greater distance, but it would be experienced with such incredible beauty that those who have experienced or glimpsed these things will say that that one experience of seeing the full beauty of the vital and mental expression of life and mind in the plant or in another human being is so incredibly beautiful that once having glimpsed that you will never be interested in material appearances of things. Well that is part of the evolution that is still waiting for us to catch up with. We are meant to experience the world through the full spectrum of the physical, vital and mental perceptions and much more importantly the spiritual and the psychic. 
But this is where he um, ends the paragraph which we com completed last time. But all of this still belongs to self-development and not yet spiritual development. We can, he says, by the self-development live more or less fully on planes of our existence other than the material which is now all in all to us. But that's still not the spiritual development which will be discussed even after. The next paragraph now moves to the mental domain and this is what we are going to start now. The physical world having been described, the vital world and then their interactions and then the bodies through which we connect to the vital and mental. Now he moves to the mental world itself. Not repeating what has already been covered which is common to the mental world but he in broad strokes summarizes the distinctions and so we will look at this and elaborate on each of these referring to earlier analogies given and earlier examples given to understand more deeply the nature of the mental world. You will recall we had in one of the sessions a few weeks ago we had discussed what it's like to be in the vital body. It is, see in the physical body we have a clear sense of form and because we have form we can speak of forward, backward, left, right, up, down and discuss shapes, circular, cubical, uh, conical, etc. But when you shift your consciousness into the vital body and the vital world, everything is fluid energy. Form or rigid form has no meaning. Front and back has no meaning because you are as if aware in all directions. So if you close your physical eyes and become aware of the vital consciousness, you are aware all around you equally. So there is no front and back for you at that point. Or rather, the sense of front in vitality is the sense of the forward movement of the energy. Energy moving to fulfill itself, leaving behind that which is done with. And that's the sense of forward, the sense of side, the sense of up and down. Similarly, is qualitative shift of energy becoming more refined or more dull. That's the sense of up down. In a world where there is no fixed direction or form. And what is it like when you transition into the mental consciousness? How is this different? And we'll touch on some of this as we go along. So we read now from the text. What has been said of the life world applies with the necessary differences to still higher planes of the cosmic existence. All planes, not just mental, but even beyond. What has been discussed and how does it apply? Well, we saw that each of the, the life world was the source of the physical. So each higher plane is as if the source of the lower. And the lower is as if a projection of the higher. Each of those intermingles with the lower gradations in a continuum. Each of those pours into the lower and has its effects which then turn back to the higher layer. Each of those has beings which interact with things on the lower realms as well as in their own world. Each of them is more free than the lower one. Now just as a quick summary when he says all that we have said of the life world applies with the necessary differences to still higher planes. And what are the necessary differences? That's what we will see now. For beyond that is a mental plane, a world of mental existence in which neither life nor matter but mind is the first determinant. Mind there is not determined by material conditions or by the life force but itself determines and uses them for its own satisfaction. So recall the analogy we will make now of the vital and the physical. In the vital world, there is no physical matter. There is only energy and qualities and forces of energy. Those energetic forms can then coalesce or focus themselves into containers of form take on temporary containers or attach themselves to physical forms. And so when the life force attaches itself to this physical form of the plant or flower, it acts in it with a certain push. You disengage it, separate it 
and the plant quickly withers within seconds if you were able to disengage very quickly. You infuse more life energy and the same half faded plant suddenly bursts into intense bright freshness. And so the determinant in the vital world is life force, not matter. But it can take on matter and enter in relation with it. In the same way in the mind world, the first determinant is mind. It is not determined by conditions of life force or matter, but it uses them. Determines and uses them for its own satisfaction. So what's it like when you are in pure mental awareness, not bound to life energy and matter? Well, one in example you have, and again it's a kind of an introspection we can do, but it's a first glimpse, it's not the real thing yet, is what happens in your daydream. In your daydream state, after a while you forget your physical realm. You forget your current emotions and energetic states. I'm tired, but somehow in the daydream, I can be quite fresh in my imaginations. And what are you doing in your daydream? Right now, I'm jumping from one tree to the next, like a monkey, perhaps. Or I leap out from the branch and I soar, floating, floating over the valley and I visualize, I see myself, feel myself flying. I'm a bird now. Or I see a bird flying and I command it to settle below me so I can ride on it like I would ride a horse. But now I fly on the bird's back. And the bird is happy. And I feel myself connected with the bird. And I build a whole relationship. All these things which you can imagine are being experienced by you in a grade of consciousness which is so fluid and plastic that almost nothing prevents you from visualizing what you like. Now you can visualize the word suddenly swells up, the bird swells up and becomes large. Or you tell the bird now to change its colors, it changes. Or you will the sky to change color and it changes. Think of what would limit you in this daydream state, you can literally visualize and create any reality. What would limit you? Almost nothing it feels as if. The realm of mind is so fluid, so free and so plastic that whatever you wish to picture, visualize, imagine becomes the reality. <coughs> this would not be the case in the vital. In the vital state, for example, when you're stuck in a state of unhappiness, sadness, you want to get out of it, but it's sticky, it holds you back. I want to be happy, but I'm unable to free myself. If somebody comes and infuses a joyous energy into me, I shift state. And now I'm in my joy state. And I look back and I've forgotten what it's like to be in this unhappy state. But in the mind world, you don't have that stickiness. It's so much fluid that you can literally swing and shift even gradations of the mind state. Up to, up to a point, because you're still in the body, bound by the life force. And in the midst of your daydream, if someone comes and gives you a knock, well, <laughs> you wake up. Because it's still happening inside the body identification. But if you were to separate from your body, and enter the mental body and float in the mind body. At that point you'll experience the full sense of freedom of the mind world. And then you recognize the quality of clarity that is there is unequaled to any experience you can have when you're identified with the physical body. You are so clear in your awareness, so free in your awareness, that it feels as if if you had to think, you could think a hundred thoughts at the same time and you would not lose the distinction between them. In your physically bound mind, try to think of two different thoughts, three different thoughts, four different thoughts. After a while, either they blur into each other and mingle or you lose one of them because your mind is somehow able only to hold two or three and even that with difficulty. If you had to narrate a story, for example, <coughs> in the Mahabharata, there is the main big story. 
in the midst of the main story let's say um, yudhishthira goes to a pond to take some water and there a being tells him will answer my question and now it enters a secondary story within that story there could be a third story within that there could be a fourth sometimes it happens that he asks rishi why is this happening rishi says well long ago this such and such a thing happened and at that time that person asked this question and so there's a second or a third story within fourth story how many can you go in in the main story create a second story within that create a third story create a fourth you already lost the thread of the first you can not barely retain first or second levels why that's the dullness created by the biology in which your mind is currently embedded freed from it in the state of pure mental consciousness you feel as if you could go into layers within layers within layers it feels as if unending and in fact you could in principle if your mind was of a higher gradation actually experience that you notice then within the mind world also there are finer gradations the relationship of the mind world to the vital world then is also interesting to see from this perspective he says mind is the first determinant mind is not determined by material conditions or by the life force but itself determines and uses them for its own satisfaction mind can now lead life force direct it guide it freely as it wants and even influence material processes as it wants through the life force and he will discuss this a little their mind that is to say the psychical and the intellectual being is free in a certain sense free at least to satisfy and fulfill itself in a way hardly conceivable to our body bound and life bound mentality for the purusha there is the pure mental being and his relations with prakriti are determined by that purer mentality nature there is mental rather than vital and physical so remember the problem was this in the physical world let's say you are this individual center of awareness and you want to do something i want to smell the flower what happens next i can't unless my biology allows me to so i need to have a functional body and a functional arm which will reach out and lift the flower bring it to a nose which has to be functional and a nervous system which is functional and a brain which is functional you know what happens when someone has a problem in the brain there's a little burst of a blood vessel and suddenly the body is paralyzed i want to smell flower i'm blocked why i'm i'm totally dependent on the physical nature which is rigid and cannot repair itself so the burst blood vessel has to go through a biological physical process to be repaired and eventually if it repairs sufficiently i can now engage and do what i want in the vital world the relation is i as conscious awareness am engaging with life energies much more fluid but the energies are sticky they pull me they make me sad or unhappy i am as if a doll played by the energy fo- forces flowing through me they shift my emotional states they determine but still i can exercise a little bit of freedom in the mental world i am relating to substance which is mental completely clear and fluid and so therefore whatever i imagine literally instantly forms becomes my reality and at that point you can see huge flexibility so he says is free in a certain sense that freedom you do not find in the vital and the physical the psychical and intellectual being is free in a certain sense free at least to satisfy and fulfill itself in a way hardly conceivable to our body bound and life bound mentality hardly conceivable if you could imagine the greatest freedom well that would be just the beginning of it 
And so what I described as the daydream is just the beginning, the real sense is what I tried to convey through those descriptions. You can literally have layers and layers of awareness and stories within stories and at the same time hold a multiplicity of hundreds of thoughts at the same time and yet have full clarity of distinction among all of them. And this is difficult for us to imagine because we have no equivalent experience when in the body. The picture, visual part of it has been as if imagined in certain movies. The most interesting one is, uh, or the first of the most interesting ones is this movie called Inception. And it's worth seeing just for this, the person uses some electronic device to enter into a dream state where they have a lucid dream, they're conscious that they're dreaming and then with the mind's awareness they shape their realities. So you can will the road to now rise up and curve and join the earlier part of the road and create a rotating road. Or you can shape buildings or command buildings to rise or change landscapes simply by imagining, visualizing it. And in the cinema, the idea is you create your realities and then you begin to live inside them and then you come back to waking state and you get back and the realities are still there intact and you can live in them and sometimes when you live there, the sense of time being different, you live for 10 hours and come back and only one hour has passed. Now you can imagine how seductive that is and this is very true in the experience when you actually go out in the mental body. It's not even that, the sense of time is so flexible, that is one of the characteristics of the freedom there. You can stretch time, you can literally will time to extend into many hours, which will be equivalent to a few minutes in your physical world. Or compress the sense of time, just as you can extend, stretch and compress space. But most importantly, you can shift in gradation of quality of awareness. Just like in the vital world there are gradations, in the mental world many more gradations, many more fine distinctions. Literally any idea that you have becomes a world in itself or can be experienced as a world in itself. Whatever you imagine is instantly creating and producing its uh, realm of experience. So is free, the mind is free in a certain sense. Why in a certain sense? You are not conscious of what is limiting you and there are things still limiting. Unlike the spiritual worlds, the mental worlds are finite. You can visualize or conceive of infinity but your infinity is always a finite which is very, very, very large. So try that in your mental uh, visualization as you are, try to imagine something infinity, some, something infinite or conceive of infinity and you see the picturization is limits of the universe but you can always recognize that whatever you are conceiving as infinity you can think of something beyond. Your infinite is actually a finiteness which is very large and you can think of what more Oh, you must now stretch out into that to include it in your infinity. But then you can still conceive of something after. And so your infinity keeps trying to extend but never really reaches an experience of infinity. Or the same problem with the sense of time. Can you conceive of eternity? Yes, it began way back. It will never end. But your sense of mind awareness of the infinite eternity still has an after and a before. And so it has to keep extending but it never reaches it. So you have a great freedom, freedom to at least to satisfy and fulfill itself in a way hardly conceivable to our mind bound and life bound mentality. But it's not yet the true freedom of spirit. In the spirit is when you have the true freedom. Here you are still bound to limitations of mind but mind being so plastic you have the illusion of a far greater freedom or at least the experience of a far greater freedom and it's the beginning, it's the first point of approach to the true freedom of the spirit. He 
there's a very interesting suggestion. You must always pause to look at these suggestions. He says, mind is the first determinant. He doesn't say mind is the only determinant. It is the first determinant. What is the second determinant? What is the third determinant? Is there a fourth determinant? So that question actually takes you to a very important implication. Remember earlier he spoke of how in nature there are no fixed gaps. Everything kind of blends into everything else. And so there was something of the vital world which blended into the physical and above it blended into the mental. So in your mental consciousness, you have a little bit of the blending of the vital influence coming up. Equally something of the physical influence blending to fill. And so although you are dealing with mind substance, it is infused with the quality of life force, of energy, even of the sense of form and materiality. And that blending is your second and third determinant. We are not yet looking at the blending that is taking place from above, from the spiritual influence blending in, or from deeper within of the psychic influence blending in. Those would be other influences. Which of these is dominant? Depends on the gradation of the mental world you are in. So as you lean towards the lower gradations of the mental worlds, you approach the vital blending and the physical blending. And so there's a point where the mind leans to the vital, and there's another point where the vital leans towards the mental and there's a point of contact. And you can as if slide from that to this world or from this to that. Or you can simply remain in the mental and blend into the vital, never fully descending into it, but allowing more and more of its influence to increase, remaining largely in the mental consciousness. And that would be a different kind of experience. Or from there, you can turn on the vital and as the second determinant, gather vital material, vital energy and substance, infuse it into the thought form that you have created. I will perhaps visualize a work to be done, a building to be constructed, or a certain event to be successful. We have the lander on the moon, which is supposed to separate and land, and you can picture it and into that you can put a positive intention, a positive energy. And what's happening is, in the mental world you're creating a picture or a form into which the energy is filled and then you relink it to or turn it towards a physical outcome. And it is released as a thought form filled with a force of energy, of intention, which goes out now to fulfill itself. Picture it's a football match between two countries. Now you have a million minds or a billion minds on each side projecting its intentions, its picturizations for a particular outcome. And you have a massive collision of energies. Much of this is vital energy. But one could conceive of a thought form put out filled with vital energy. And that would have a very different quality. The clash there will not be of a vital collision of energy pulling, pushing in a kind of uh, tornado-like experience which is typical in the vital world when these energies collide. So you have, let's say, a football match to take place. Everybody from each of these countries is now projecting their vital energies. There's a huge energetic whirlpool, so to say, of clashing energies. But if you look at the equivalent in the mind world, most people are not conceiving with clarity of thought. They're putting out energy impulses. But a few who put out a clear outcome in thought will create thought forms which come and join, combine, modify. But the push in the mind is not of the vital energy of collision, but attempting to relate to each other and find their fit with each other. And so the whole experience in the mental world is very different. So you have a physical activity, you have a, a vital tornado or storm above it, and above that is a mental pull-push of thought forms, largely connected to their vital, let's say, impulses. But the mental acts like a seed. 
So in the mental there will be a clarity. This is not the emotional push, but a clarity. This outcome has to go this way, the path of it, the manner in which it has to happen. This person has to function in this way, that in the other way. And the influence of the mental brings clarity, whereas the influence of the vital creates agitation. All these are combining. The players also are affected on the level of their mental body, their vital body, these influences filling in. If they have in themselves a sufficient clarity, they can tap into the mental idea and catch it and execute it. They can connect to each other on a mental domain and create a structure of harmony in thought, in the team, which would make it effective and coordinate it as if it is one being, one person. And while one person is pushing the ball, others align in a mental construct. And upon this construct are other thought forms, touching, pushing, pulling, modifying. So the whole experience of the mental consciousness and formations in the mental world is very different. You could intervene on any of these three. On a physical level, if for example, there's a little bump on the field, somebody trips and falls. On a vital level, if there's a sudden surge of energy, that pulls or pushes a person or interferes in their action. Again, you could have a trip or a fall. On a mental level, there could be an intervention which breaks the harmony or strengthens the harmony and there could be a change in the outcome. There's a very interesting incident which is not so publicized and I believe it was in the 1980s when uh, it was still during the Cold War and the Soviet Union on one side and the military intelligence of the United States on the other side were developing forms of psychological warfare and they were playing with it, applying it. So there was a chess match where on one side was the American chess master, the other side was the Soviet chess master. They were playing and suddenly the American chess master got up and said, I'm sorry, uh, these people, and he pointed to four or five people sitting in the audience, said, they are interfering with my clarity of thought. Please have, have them removed. Now, it some, sounds so strange when it is said in the normal context, but from a perspective of the mental body and the power of mind, it's the most obvious thing to happen. In fact, every single person in the audience is somehow projecting a mental or emotional component. For a chess game, there's not so much excitement, much more clarity of thought involved. But what if a few people deliberately project a formation on the players, clouding their mind or pushing them, nudging them into a particular track of thought or impulsive action? The mastery of the chess master is not only in his knowledge of the game, but in his ability to ward off such influences. They will put it in other terms, they will say, in the stress of the game, I lost my objectivity and I got tense about losing, so I took this direction as a move and so I lost. I lost my clarity from my passion or my expectation or fear. But how do you know that passion, expectation or fear was yours and not somebody else's projected into you? How do you know that the clarity of your thought which you had being clouded was not a projection from outside? How do you know that the thought you had to do it this way because it's so convincing was not an outside thought? The reality is, and this is what Sri Aurobindo points out earlier in the discussion of the vital, the bulk of what enters us is from outside. Recall the passage where he describes hmm, a great part of our thoughts and feelings come into us from outside, from our fellow men, both from individuals and from the collective mind of humanity. And the full import of this, we do not truly appreciate. There's a very interesting example which was given by Ingo Swan. I've mentioned him many times and I find him still one of the most interesting figures in this domain. He describes how he was 
at some point asked to monitor certain things. Uh, he, he had this ability to remote view. He was asked by the military in the United States to monitor certain things for their national security. And at one point he was asked to remote view certain places on the moon. And he was shocked because he saw tracks, he saw lights, he saw beings working. And first he thought he had got to the wrong place, but then it was confirmed it was actually on the moon. I don't go into the details, you can read that on your own if you want. But then he suggests something very interesting in the book where he documents this incident. He says, subsequently you notice, nobody thinks of going on the moon. Somehow that is closed to the human mind. Oh yeah, we've been there, done that, it's over. And everybody for the last 20 years has been talking about going to Mars. Whereas if you go back 40 or 50 years ago when the moon landing took place, the plan was to create a moon base from which to go to Mars would be easier. And then suddenly the whole thing was shut down and nobody is even thinking about the moon. And he suggests there in that book that there's like a psychic screen projected on humanity to prevent us from thinking of the moon. Now he was a very highly developed psychic and for him to say that it was coming from an experience and it's a fact. There are such screens which are imposed on collectives by beings, physical beings, or even beings of the vital or mental and sometimes of the spiritual worlds also, sometimes to guide through a transitional passage for a whole civilization or even a planet's development, to prevent it going into certain directions or to nudge it into other directions. And we are completely unaware of how much of such an intervention has led humanity in its development or protected it in its development from certain possibilities. And that's why the Vedic view is that our human physical events are almost like a reflection of the interactions between higher beings, vital, mental, spiritual, and their interplay and their influence on us. We are almost like puppets. When you go to the hall next door where there are paintings by Huta, which mother did with Huta or she did through Huta, she took passages from Savitri. And there's one passage, I don't remember the passage now, but where Sri Aurobindo describes how uh, human beings are like dolls or toys in the hands of these larger beings. And mother had Huta draw this painting where there are these two or three large beings and human beings are little dolls and they are tossed around and swung around by these large beings helplessly, unaware that we are actually playing or pushed by these forces. It's the same idea which is much more concretely articulated in the Greek civilization and Greek mythology that the collision or conflict between two deities actually represents itself through their favorites or through their embodiments on earth and their collisions creating entire wars just because two gods or deities got into a conflict, let's see who's more powerful, you or I. And they're having a little combat there and on earth it takes the form of gigantic war between two cultures or two civilizations or two kingdoms. And this is the reality in fact. We are not conscious of how much of these influences come into us. So much of what we call discoveries of science are actually projections from above of a certain idea which is put out into the collective consciousness of humanity and suddenly you have hundreds of people thinking of those things and then one or two suddenly discover it across the world and it happened by chance. No, it's not by chance. The thought was already there looking for instruments through which to express itself. So in fact there are strong influences of thought formations projected by higher beings or more powerful beings in the domain of mind who lead and guide the thought development in humanity. And occasionally they even put out emanations who can become as if vibhutis who have extraordinary capacity and as if think out all the thoughts which then are developed over the age subsequently. 
Sri Aurobindo gave the example of Leonardo da Vinci as one such vibhuti who defined the age of what followed as Renaissance and the whole of modern Europe and the development of the mind, the modern mind. Somebody had to embody it in a human body, in a single individual and imprint it in humanity through that human mind. And he was that vibhuti for that purpose. And so you will see in his work as if he anticipates all the subsequent developments, all the subsequent forms of thought. He's a genius in every field that he touches. It's not possible for, for an evolutionary person to suddenly pop up, wake up one day and develop all this. It's as if from above these things pour in, they lift a human vessel or they embody in a human vessel and having organized it in a human mind, it ripples out. But it comes from above as a formation. Now all this is to point out that the realm of mind is far more effective in terms of consequence than even the vital or the physical. But mind being not as seductive as vital energy, not as compelling in its drive of desire because, well, it's not desire, it's thought awareness. It does not have the same attraction as the vital has. But it influences and determines even the vital movements or can give context to the vital movement in a way that can completely defeat certain vital formations. So it has happened to us many times. We are lost in a passionate moment, anger, hatred or any form of passion. And then suddenly something kicks in and you say, what am I doing? And there's that moment of waking up in the mind which looks at that moment of passion and says, but is this what I want to do? And suddenly the passion is lost. What happened there? A mind form, a thought awareness imprinted, either pulled you into its level or infused itself into you and woke you and put a context in which you saw the fruitlessness or the dangerous character of that moment of passion. And suddenly the thing is lost or changed or put in context and a choice is made which changes everything. So in fact we find although mind is much less compelling in its drive, it is a far greater originator and organizer of everything that follows subsequently. If you think about the nature of desire even, Desire is seeking an outcome. The outcome is actually conceived by the mind. Desire is only an energy that is directed by the thought form or the idea behind. And so, there is their mind, that is to say, the psychical and intellectual being is free in a certain sense, free at least to satisfy and fulfill itself in a way hardly conceivable to our body-bound and life-bound mentality. For the Purusha there is the pure mental being and his relations with, with Prakriti are determined by that purer mentality. Nature there is mental rather than vital and physical. So whatever the mind or the Purusha conceives shapes itself as mental substance which has its ripple effect on other gradations eventually. Now he speaks of this relationship. Both the life world and indirectly the material are a projection from that. The result of certain tendencies of the mental being which have sought a field, conditions, an arrangement of harmonies proper to themselves. And the phenomena of mind in this world may be said to be a result of the pressure of that plane first on the life world and then on life in the material existence. There are two parts to the sentence. First he speaks of generally of this relationship and second of the phenomena in the material world of mind developing. So let's look at the general first and then we'll understand more deeply the importance of this second observation. He says, 
the life world is a projection from the mental and the material world is indirectly a projection from the mental the indirection being life so mind projects to form life world life projects to form material world but mind does not directly relate to material world now this is extremely important it means that when you are thinking something you're picturing visualizing imagining it's not going to change your material reality in a go because that's not the link directly it will influence the life energy flows the life energy flows will change the material reality so you want the flower to become fresh with life force you can imagine all you want become fresh become fresh become fresh no it's not going to happen but your thought imagination can gather life energy direct the life energy infuse into life energy the intention of it filling and freshening the flowers and allow it to direct life force life force now will enter following the thought which you have given life force will penetrate and act on it this indirection of the relationship is extremely important when you are dealing with your body often you feel your body is not quite what you imagine it should be your mind feels your body i feel myself quite slim i look in the mirror and i say oh where is this bloating coming from my stomach has bloated i don't want it to bloat i visualize it's not going to change the mind has to lead the life energy which will change the biology so even if you want to make your hand more conscious the mind still has to act through the life energy to make it more conscious the body in itself is not conscious it is unconscious the mind enters into body through the nervous system to sen- acquire sensation but what is the medium in the nervous system electricity or life energy so even for mind to sense what the body is feeling it has to pass through life force but the quality of life force it acts on is a grade which is very close to the mental if you can if that grade gets dulled then suddenly the sensations of your body become dull which is what happens when let's say you are low in energy you don't feel as much when your energy level rises it fills up and a finer grade of energy comes you find all your senses get highly amplified highly sensitized you see finer gradations of color your touch is more sensitive you lose that higher gradation and now your touch is less sensitive you see less fine what are the things which will change in the body remember there is the mind bound by life mind bound by matter so you eat foods which are dulling the quality of energy they bring is dense coarse and you'll find after a while all your senses begin to dim there's recently a news item i saw a few just yesterday about a young boy in the uk for 7 years he ate only junk food and now they declared him he has become blind why because there's severe deficiencies of very various vitamins that's the physical perspective of what has happened it's actually the loss of the higher gradation of energy because he has only filled his body with this dullness all the higher gradations being dulled well all the faculties now get dulled you eat lots of fruit and fine quality of energy filling and after a while you'll suddenly feel very light your thoughts will become clear and your perceptions becoming clearer your ability to hold multiple thoughts will grow etc so the biology and the grade of energy functioning can directly modify the quality of mind developing inside the body mind where it's still dependent but freed from the body mind into your pure mental body you're free and from there you can influence guide vitality and physicality how does it guide vitality now he puts it in such essential terms if you just read it casually you will miss the point or it doesn't make sense he says the life world and indirectly the material are a projection from that the result of certain tendencies of the mental being which have sought a field 
conditions and arrangement of properties of an arrangement of harmonies proper to themselves that's the mechanism by which mind influences the vital and physical so there are three things here the mental being has sought a field condition and arrangement of harmonies and that's what makes for the control that mind has on the vital so let's look at how that works remember vital is a cluster of energies pulling pushing all at the same time a picture one can give is of radio waves of different frequencies right now let's say you have a few thousand radio stations broadcasting in a distance of many thousand miles kilometers all those radio waves at different frequencies are passing right through you from different directions of course we sense nothing but if you have to picture it you will see a wave of frequencies moving from this direction another wave of different frequencies from that direction another wave from here 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 all criss crossing through your body right now and of course the most powerful is your mobile towers nearby which also there are several in different directions and their energy is passing right through you they have no effect because nothing in you responds or at least it responds only nominally so the first thing is a field a field in which all these energies have been placed in a certain relation if you had to picture it this is the image different frequencies like lines with intensities represented by length of a line and all of them on the point that is you so put it this way an arrow here arrow here arrow here and each arrow at depending on frequency you can put it on a height and intensity would indicate the size of the arrow so here is you and different arrows pulling pushing on different directions with different intensities that's your field then the mind can change the field it chooses a field where now all the arrows would point in a different direction or a same direction and that changes the arrangement of energies and the outcome of the energies if all the energies are pushing in opposite directions you have a certain outcome if all the energies align to push in the same direction you'll have a different outcome but the field in which the energies are set the way they are arranged is going to be your first space of mind thought idea in which energy is going to flow so recall you see this is it sounds very abstract but remember in the example we took earlier at the beginning when you are in the pure vital consciousness no forms there is no up down left right all is quality of energy right so in the mind it gets even more essential all is thought awareness the way awareness relates to itself in different ways awareness relating to itself can conceive of collision can conceive of alignment can conceive of wide expanse or narrow focus that's your field first level and then in that field conditions so you arrange conditions in which this energy has such a particular objective when it meets that particular idea it relates this way when it meets that idea it relates that way so let's say i put out a certain intention for the plant to grow the life force has to flow along the stem it will not go this way in the stem it will go up through the stem fill flowers so when it meets flowers it has to spread when it meets the stem it has to move in a straight line following the curve of the stem when it's outside the stem it has to enter stem you are formulating in idea the conditions of the energy flow in a field which is now your flower plant focus third step arrangement of harmonies so now that energy if it amplified too much would burn the flowers perhaps isn't it if it went into the wrong direction it would reverse the chemical operations which are needed to sustain the flowers so what is the harmony and the particular cluster of energies working together in harmony 
So one branch of the energies has to go now to increase the flow of sap. Another branch of energies has to grow to increase the colors. Another branch to do something else. But they have to work in relation with each other in a particular way. So you have a field which in my mind now focuses upon this. I have conditions of the relation of the energy working and then the alignment of the energy in harmony with each other. And the mind now form it, forming this, the energies which are an expression of the mind or a push of the mind to move, now begin to flow. They begin to act, they begin to organize. And after a while, the flowers begin to brighten. Or the reverse. You recall the example which we had taken a few weeks ago which mother describes of uh, Madame Théon, who was her teacher in occultism, taking this uh, fruit that she places on her stomach and she absorbed all the nourishment from the fruit directly and the fruit became a limp, small, mm, shrunken form. What, did she what she absorbed was not the physical juice, but the life force. But the life force which was filling it and amplifying the whole fruit and making it round and full. You shrink and absorb the life force, the whole thing collapses. What did she do to access that? Through the mind awareness, now entering the fruit, becoming conscious of the flow of life energy. And remember, mind awareness is a consciousness. It feels and then it changes. First, that's the field. The operation is limited to the fruit then the conditions in which it has to operate and then the harmony. It turns all the juices and draws them into her body. And so all the life forces which were now operating to full, to fill and flow, to support, now turn and move and follow the form of thought which is leading them and the body absorbs. So the experience from the mental consciousness is actually you enter inside, you feel, you sense the energy flows and then you as if grip them in your awareness and turn and pull. But it was all done by mind awareness, not life force. It led the life force and of course you may feel the life force now following, dragging along the awareness. If you think about uh, how people do this, uh, if you watch a coach for example, the coach is observing a student who is about to do a somersault. And the coach watches, yes, 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 do it now. Now, leap. And the coach, you'll see his body moving as if wanting to push the person. You see an audience watching the football match. The fellow is about to kick and they're on the edge of the seat, literally as if they want to kick the ball. In your mind, you are as if identifying with the person and in that identification as if pushing their energy. And that kind of feeling, except now you're doing it, in this case, in a different form, whatever outcome is sought. So these three words are very interesting because it describes how thought awareness guides or sets up the frame in which the energy gets guided and form of outcome of energy is decided. Any of these three things not sufficiently clear, you will have mixed results. So if field is not clear, my action on this flower, I'm trying to bloom the flower, and what happened? Oh, it didn't bloom. I say I failed, and nobody noticed that the other flower sitting in the vase there bloomed. Why? Because I did not direct the awareness correctly, or the awareness was too spread out and it caught the flowers which were more receptive first. Often this is what happens uh, when people do some kind of healing, and especially in laboratory conditions. One of the biggest problems is a kind of a infection of the healing energy. So you have a particular sample on which a healing energy is put for increasing a particular outcome, but other samples in the lab room tended to catch that and seem to have similar results also. How do you prevent contamination of energy? Especially when they do distant healing, you don't have a clear point to focus. I want to direct it to a sample in a particular lab. I push an energy with whatever mechanism of distant healing, but how do I prevent it from touching other samples in the lab?
mostly you don't and the way in which it is done is by creating often a visual link so you place the sample in front of a webcam you watch it through a skype call that's the way the mind is focusing energy now imagine yourself on a phone call in the old days without a video and you're talking to your grandmother or a close friend across the world and you're speaking and you're trying to picture what they are like you hear in their voice their smile and you try to picture their smile you try to imagine how they are in their room but you may be wrong in your picture you may not realize oh you're actually sitting outside in the garden i didn't realize i thought you're sitting in your room because you were trying to picture create an image but when you're doing a video call straight away there's a clear focus the field is defined and your attention is now narrowed because you have access to that so the definition of the field can make a very big difference to the outcome we see for example people who are uh, doing this experiment of bending spoons with thought and of course it's not done with thought it's done with life force but thought directs life force often what happens is you'll see in a group of people doing it you say bend 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 of course it doesn't bend and suddenly somebody says hey look mine bent and your attention momentarily distracted you look at that person's spoon and plop your spoon bends interesting the very attempt to focus your attention in a picture and a force and a mental false construct was preventing the actual action which had to happen not by your visualization but by something deeper operating and when your force of mind was directed away it popped in and did what it needed to do so and conditions and arrangement of harmonies if the forces are not harmonized and the conditions are not clearly defined often it leads to contrary results or it continues to have results when they should not so for example an intention is put for a particular outcome let's say for the rain to happen but the conditions were not clearly defined we didn't get the rain but after a week the rains come they are very strong but that's the time when we don't want the rains there was not a clear formulation of conditions or the right relation set in the forces or uh, the last example i want to give is a forces which are not properly harmonized you have put out an energy for an outcome to stop rain and then you've put out an energy for an outcome to have rain but the earlier energy is still there and it's contradicting your energy put out now and you don't realize that you're actually fighting yourself is a very interesting uh, ex- example given by a friend who was in business and he would often because he had to things were at such a difficult situation would put out very strong formations for certain outcomes and then a month or two later he would find the force of that energy coming back upon him as if seeking replenishment and he says where is this coming from this is supposed to have been finished a month ago but the intention and energy or the thought form put out was still hanging around and now colliding with the new intentions put out when a change circumstance so all of this is it's a critical element for the successful outcome and as long as you're operating from a mental consciousness you can only do so much remember sri aurobindo speaks of the sense of freedom freedom in a certain sense but the freedom is hampered by the incompleteness of the mental knowledge itself what's the best way what's the best outcome i don't know i create a formation and i release it i'm not aware of so many other things which are out there against which it is colliding and i don't realize this thought in form i have put now may end up contradicting the larger outcome later because i don't see the full chain of cause and effect none of these limitations would exist in a supra mental action the supra mental action first of all the consciousness itself being infinite is aware of the whole and the whole in this case is all that exists it's in a consciousness in which you experience the whole world the whole universe all the planes and all of the past present future in one continuum 
And in a consciousness which holds this past, present, future and all together, a certain outcome and focus of the field, let's say the flower. And then conditions. And the conditions are seen because everything is known. The conditions intended here are known in relation to other larger conditions including the humidity of the air and the fact that this flower will perhaps go out of this room after an hour and meet completely different circumstances and then be put into water or not. All those conditions are seen. And then your intervention and the particular harmony of alignments projected. And unlike the mental consciousness, which is different from the vital consciousness, which is different from the physical, and so each has to act through different media with modifications on each level, the supramental consciousness has knowledge, which is its own power, which is its own result. So there is not this mix or dilution or loss of conflict between two or three levels. So the supramental action becomes aware and in the very awareness which is complete, it becomes the movement of energy. The knowledge is the energy and is the outcome. It's done smoothly effortlessly at no point there is any collision with present energies or in future or past energies because everything is known in perfect harmony and everything is done smoothly, spontaneously and perfectly. <clears throat> the supramental consciousness filling the mind seizes upon its aspect of knowledge, filling the vital seizes upon its aspect of power, see, filling the physical seizes upon its aspect of form. And so it is one consciousness that acts through all three and so perfectly harmonizes and, al and aligns across these levels. So the point which comes up later in the next paragraph is that it is only the spiritual action which can give this completeness and perfect and assured outcome, which is the character of the supramental. Otherwise, we are speaking of the mind working through these limitations, translating through the vital, which has its own limitations and its own demands and compulsions, and then working into the physical domain, which has its own other limitations. And so, whatever you may put out, the outcome will be broadly in that direction, but there will always be some flaws some failures and sometimes even complete opposite of what you intended and you don't know why. Although your conception was so clear in intention and form. I'm looking ahead of the discussion but it is to put in context this working of mind and its relation to the vital. Through the vital the same form now takes a more concretized uh, appearance, the field now reduced to limited form, the conditions becoming more rigidified and the forces now becoming more mechanical and repetitive, which makes for the physical form. Now if you can capture this triple aspect of the mind operating on the vital and in the physical, you have the essential principles of the phenomenon of materialization described here. The mind conceives, let's say, an apple which you want to materialize. The field defined, the conditions defined, the arrangement of harmony of forces defined, and then the gathering of life force, condensing, densifying the material. It's literally materializing, becoming more and more dense until it acquires a character of materiality holding these three aspects and you have the appearance of the apple. If sufficiently materialized, you can literally eat the apple and swallow it. Otherwise, you have a half-formed, semi-materialized, maybe rigid to the touch or translucent in appearance and then eventually it lapses back. But what has been done is a formation begun in the mind world, seizing upon material of the vital, organizing, putting it in harmony along the template of the mind formation and the vital itself becoming like a template for physical material substance or densifying into material substance. And you have your materialization. The variation to materialization is what we actually do 
regularly, when you conceive of an outcome and then the outcome happens. You don't call it a materialization normally, but uh, you wanted to have this building, the architect conceived of it and then it was materialized. But it took matter from the physical world and arranged it to fit the template of the mind. That's how you would put it. Of course, there was the intermediate passage of the vital energy. The energy of people, the energy of resources, even financial energy, which flowed along the template organized by the mind, but which made possible the physical objects which were out there to be brought and fitted into a template. So, this, the form of materialization which we have today in our normal human life still relies on this three-step operation. If any of these three factors of field conditions or arrangement of harmonies is not proper, then the outcome here would be also improper. In the engineering drawings, they missed a particular element and that makes the building weak or it makes for certain things to be not aligned or it makes the uh, room too resonant to sound. Why? Because the particular arrangement and relation of sound was not properly thought out in the original conception. So you can see it's still following the same thing. But the full power of mind will come not through mind but the super mind which will actually conceive and lead all the way down to a full materialization, even. The current form in which you see these materializations as magical events is more vital beings who kind of seize upon the mental idea, fill it with vital energy and densify it to create a physical material object or more often, which is the case when you have people materializing little objects and dolls and idols or watches or gems, they've kept it somewhere else where it was dematerialized, brought into your hand and rematerialized. But that's not quite the same thing. But still, it is matter which has been as if lifted up through gradations, transported and then densified. But when it is lifted up through gradations, its material density is as if reduced and its content of thought, life, which is there in every object, is more held and then brought back into material density. I'm just explaining these because this is how you will see the relationship of the mind world, life world and physical world in continuity. And the phenomena of mind in this world, that is us thinking as thinking beings, may be said to be a result of the pressure of that plane first on the life world and then on life in the material existence. Remember earlier he spoke of how life in matter came because the life world was pushing itself to organize itself in matter. And it triggered this process of rearranging matter to create cellular life and then more complex life and so on. But mind emerging in this living being, living creatures or even in the single cells of uh, bacteria is the product of life world pushing upon, uh, is the product of mind world pushing upon life, acting inside life and indirectly through life acting on matter. And the result is, you cannot have pure mind appearing in matter. You can only have life emerging and inside life the mind emerging. If there was pure mind in matter, the effect would be very different. It would be very similar to our computers, where you do not see life force. You see only the computer doing some calculations and putting out a thought or representation of a thought as an outcome. But even there, it uses a denser grade of life force which we call electricity to animate itself. But because mind has to pass through the vital in order to become physical, there will always be this layer, however thin you may make it or however dense you may make it. This understanding is key. It is key to all mind action uh, being successful in matter. So the first action is on life world and then on life in the material existence. Now let's take the example of your body. You want to reshape your body. 
your mind can't do it directly but your mind can act on the life force in the body in the life force it can produce the change which will lead to the physical change and that will be your key so literally you have to feel with your mind awareness the flow of life energy within you shape it reorient it reorganize it and then it will shape and reorganize the biological process notice life force is blocked in certain flows or it is agitated and chaotic in certain parts the mind can will it to bring calm to bring clarity to bring harmony and then what was this ease or more correctly disharmony now has got harmonized and that will change the biological process and bring harmony in the biology so pressure of plane of mind on life world and then on life in material existence the part of life force which is embedded in the body that is what is going to be modified by the mind working on life energy and therefore body follows this principle will act even on an atom you could take molecular structures atomic structures mind acting on the life force inside will modify the structure at a physical level eventually and this is how you transmute materials by a similar uh, inter intervention uh, you will recall the example which is uh, of ganapati muni one of the very great sages in uh, the previous century he would be visiting some families with whom he would stay during his wanderings and they were often poor people so he had taken from them the benefit of the resources of the family which who gave always with love and affection so he wanted to give back so he would ask for a one anna coin which is the lowest uh, denomination or one paisa coin hold it in his hand and then he would be sitting with the children telling them stories that's another way of his giving back to the family sharing with them higher values and at the end of the story he would give back the coin and it had been transmuted into gold which they would use to sustain themselves financially so it was held in his hand and a certain intention of mind placed a certain will shaping the structure of life force flow which of course ends up in the physical form changing and you have the result but the same thing much more easily done on our biology because biology is living substance and it shapes much more easily than hard matter dead matter rather so mind itself appears because of the pressure of the life world of the mind world on life producing in us the awakening of thought so the implication of course is wherever there is life there is an element of mind if there was not life could not have been organized into the material world so if you take a single cell of course there's a life force working but there's a template of mind and its definition of field condition and arrangement of harmony which holds the cell together and maintains its activity if you interfere with that the cell would die but it would lose its internal balance and break down or you could modify that and the cell would behave differently so when the healer intervenes and makes the cells grow well it is through the mind awareness that the life force is being redirected so in anything there's a mind component and a life component even in so called dead matter and even in the atom now he speaks of something else by its modification in the life world it creates in us the desire mind so having awakened mind in us there's a life force there's mind but its action in the life world or the in the life world there's a mind modifying as it blends in we have the desire which is appearing in mind which is very different from life force having desire so the desire of pure life force is i want i'm craving i need and i can't control myself the drive itself pushes my body in the craving but the desire of mind is in my clarity of thought i say i wish i could do this it doesn't have the life force driving 
But in the mind quality itself, there is the quality of desire emerging. That's life permeating into mind, giving to it its quality, but in substance which is primarily mind. So I look at the situation and I look at the situation and I say, I wish it could be better. But it's a mind wish, it's not a life force drive of passion or instinct pushing. So just as mind infused into the vital to give to it direction, vital infuses into mind to give to it the sense of desire in mind. So, it creates the desire mind. In its own right, it awakes in us the pure powers of our psychical and intellectual existence. So when mind is in itself, the pure power is what would be relevant to the pure intellect and the psychical. Now we have not dwelt on this so far. The psychical and the intellectual. The psyche, Sri Aurobindo uses not in the sense of the psychic being, but in the sense of the deeper urges within us or the deeper awareness within us of which the intellect is one narrow form of working. So anything to do with a deeper sense of awareness which can stand back and then the intellect which is the form in which this can articulate in the mind zone. These two things freed of the desired nature will give us that pure clarity in which you know exactly what you have to do and you have clarity of understanding unmixed with your desire impulse. But that clarity can be narrow and limited. I need this. Or it can be wide, we need this. Or it can be still wider, the universe needs for this to happen. And although that which has to happen is not of help to my need, I still do what is right rather than what I want. And so the sense and the scope of the mind can change its perspective and the beauty of the mind because it's so flexible the shift of perspective can happen very easily if you train your mind. You may have a habit of thinking from an egocentric perspective you can easily shift the habit to think from the universe perspective. And I would suggest this as an exercise maybe we can do this for the next one week. Try to look at any situation where you have to take a decision not from the perspective of your interest, but what would be the universe looking at it think of it? What would be most helpful to the universal evolution? And you'll find that it frees you. It gives to it something closer to the pure power of your mind. Because now you're no more identified with your narrow little I desire sense. You know what's right, you know what's best, and then you just do what is what it is. And because you begin to think like this, you'll find it's easier to do. Because already in the activity of thinking like this, you free yourself from the more personalized, habitual desire mind in which you are used to living otherwise. And it's an interesting exercise. And it can prepare the mind to open to something greater than itself. But we'll end with this one more sentence. But our surface mentality is only a secondary result of a larger subliminal mentality whose proper seat is the mental plane. And so now the picture is like this. This part which says I'm thinking is as if the tail end or the surface most tip of mind which entering deeper opens out to something wider until it actually lives in the mental plane. And of the mental plane, a special concentration of awareness, narrowed, gathered, and then dulled and limited and plugged in into the surface part of your mind is this tip that says, I'm conscious, I'm thinking. And in fact, because there is a continuum from here to the mental body living in the mental plane proper, it is from there that suggestions from the mental world enter us pop up from inside and we say, ah, I have an idea. You notice you rarely think out something. You have a problem and your mind wanders around the problem looking for how do I solve it. 
and then pop something comes and you say I have an idea I thought of it no you didn't you received a suggestion from the mental plane which popped up while you were wandering and looking for a solution but why did the solution come at that point because this inner part of the mind which is subliminal is conscious of the surface part even if the surface is not conscious of the inner and so the moment you start looking for a solution it says ah let me help you and it pushes the solution to you but you are so busy thinking that you do not receive the solution and so often what happens is you think 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 and then you give up and you go to sleep you wake up with the solution because that's the time when the suggestion caught your mind in a quieted state and could pop up so recognizing this we can consciously change the relationship between the surface mind and the inner or true mind and that means each time you have a problem well you think of all the options so that's what defines the field it's very important to do that what's the full spectrum full field full domain in which you want the solution applied you look at all the conditions which you have to tap into or deal with and the balance of forces pulling and pushing that picture you must fully make clear in your mind and then turn inward quieting your mind turn inward or upward as if towards a deeper or higher source from which the true insight will come and you wait in a quieted state and so if you have trained yourself now to remain quiet or to open to these inner or higher parts then you can actually do this easily and open and then you will experience the thought suggestion or the intuition as it actually enters you will feel it entering you will become conscious of it entering and taking a thought form after a while you'll find you can catch it before it takes a thought form and it will be a more essential insight which will have much broader application even in changing circumstances and at some point you'll be aware of it in its pure intuitive entry and that will be the most powerful insight that you can gain because that can master multiple aspects or multiple thought forms in which it can apply itself but this is a practice one can begin define the domain conditions and the cluster of forces you have to resolve turn with a quiet awareness now and with an aspiration and ask for the help and stay in a quiet receptive state inviting of course at a coarser level or at a lower level it will be from the inner part of the mind at a higher level it will be from the higher part which is the intuitive mind or even from the divine you will receive something higher if that is what you turn to in your aspiration so we'll pause here there are other implications of this relationship of our surface mind with the true in and inner mind which we will take up next time and how he describes subsequently how the things from the mental world are constantly impacting from us and how there are realms with which we can enter in relation of the mental world and even beings of the mental world and uh, how the planes blend into each other as he has described earlier and all of that we will take up next friday we can pause here for any comments or questions yes I cannot hear you actually. Uh, I guess I have a point that the mind that you are talking about is, the, is an aberration of a brain mind mm -hmm. and the brain mind is one of the most grace in the universe. It's a great form of desire. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess for me, the question becomes when you do become aware of that perception rather than Mm -hmm. and, um, the other day, I'm, I'm a big follower of the yoga for many decades, mm -hmm. but also very uh, aware to Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the other day, I read about the etheric body, and 
So the first important idea to recognize is that our little narrow thinking mind is a tiny projection. I won't use the word aberration, but it's a projection or a first formation of something which, is, which can grow to become much larger and opening out eventually to the whole universal mind itself. But recognizing its right relation with this larger mind awareness. And then we recognize that out of that universal mind, things flow and pass through us. Sometimes ideas pass right through and we are not even conscious. Some ideas we catch, but in the act of catching, they get warped and we shape them to fit our desires, expectations and so on, or habits and so on. The first part is becoming aware of the relationship. The second thing which comes from the awareness is that you can have control or choice. And then the moral aspect may follow, but uh, already by that time, you have developed a certain poise and a perspective in which I won't use the word moral anymore, but it's obvious that certain things are helpful, some things are not. It's obvious that there is a potential for misuse of certain ideas or there's a potential for positive application. And in that very poise of being obvious, the choice is there. You also know what you have to do. So morality is still something you use when you're not conscious of what's coming in or where it's coming from and then you make a kind of a choice to say, ah, this is right, this is wrong. But there's a poise in which you rise, in which even the sense of right and wrong is a, a construct of the mind. You just know that this is aligned to the whole, it is true, and that is a distortion. What is wrong is more a distortion of a true thought. And you just flow with what is true and what is right and spontaneously expressing. And it transcends morality and it's more true than morality which is a more false formation which is useful in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. But yes, there is a choice to be made, naturally, especially. Yes, sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, please. Did I say five? No, well, he's at, maybe I said five. I don't know, I don't remember. It is by mistake. The three things he describes, the field, the conditions, and the arrangement of harmonies. Hmm? And you see this arrangement of harmonies, I've tried to take examples very picturing it this way. But in the pure mental consciousness, the harmonies are something so essential that they're difficult to describe except by taking analogies. And I'll try to convey something of what this is. When you look at numbers, 
Just take the first 10 numbers and look at their relationships. One, two, and then three is as if two plus one. Four is three plus one, but it's also two plus two. And five is two plus three, but it's also four plus one. And then the relationship's more complex. 12 is a product of three and four and two and six. And if you look at these relationships and try to remove the number form and just hold the relationships, it's as if a web of qualities held in a certain pattern of relationships, of dependencies, of interconnections. And the experience in the pure mental consciousness of what he's describing here, arrangement of harmonies, is felt like this. Mother describes how Maybe I'll try to get that passage next time, but I think I've read it a year or two ago here. She describes how often at night when she's working from the higher planes, she's influencing circumstances in the world in which people and situations are experienced as if numbers, she says, but not quite numbers. And then she's arranging them to put them in a certain alignment and by putting them in those alignments, it leads to certain consequences which result in particular outcomes on the material plane. And she uses this phrase, she says, as if arranging numbers, but not quite numbers, they're not numbers, they are actual ideas, you know, qualities of consciousness held, and she's putting them in this kind of relationship of harmony. If you think about it, let's say we are a team working together, let's say four or five of us, and we often have collisions in the work. Think of why that is. And you'll notice somebody has a hard resistance to something which may come from a fear, from the past, or it may still simply be he feels overwhelmed by somebody else's energy, or he feels jealous and something pulls back, or he feels an aggression and so he insists, or he feels weak and he compensates by pushing harder. All these things are really patterns of energy in each one of us and the particular arrangement of those patterns makes for our dynamic of positive, negative and other outcomes. Now if you abstract this at the level where you remove the energy itself but just the relationship of these energies, you notice something very interesting. Your insecurity and my strength become complementary if aligned in a particular way. Or your clarity and my confusion, if sufficiently aligned, would lead to something. Your perspective of larger inclusive uh, ideas and my perspective of detailing and being lost in specifics, again, could be aligned to become complementary. Everything which you see as conflicting right now could potentially be somehow rearranged to become harmonious. And if let's say five of us sit together and we had the capacity to put ourselves in right relation in all these different aspects to each other, suddenly we would feel ourselves perfectly in sync, working as a team, perfectly aligned, and each one of us complementing each other, we would just flow through and make everything happen perfectly with all our strengths amplified and all our weaknesses neutralized. Except we can't do that. We're too rigid, we're too unaware. But if this could be done, and of course it can be done at least in small steps in our higher parts, and the way to do it in a very practical way is we sit together and the process mother recommends, we align ourselves to our highest ideal or our common objective, whatever that may be. We want this project to succeed and what is our definition of the success for it? And then, each one of us consciously sets apart something which is entering in conflict with others so that we may have a better harmony. And each person pulls back the part which is leading to collision or conflict. And then we again regroup and connect and now we find there's a better harmony. And each time you do that, you are as if rearranging a little bit and a little bit and putting it in alignment with others and bit by bit we form this harmony where we build complementarities and strength as a unit, as a team. 
But the same thing is how mother describes, she is doing from above, she takes these, she looks at these people, she takes their threads of energy, so to say, or consciousness tendencies and pulls them and aligns and rearranges and they fit in and they click together and here on earth circumstances people wake up and suddenly, oh, today we are working in much better harmony, we don't know why. So a very simple way you could do is start your day sitting together in concentration, invoking that presence of harmony, opening yourself to that divine presence and it will do this to you if you open yourself truly, fully. But you could also do it by this exercise of consciously becoming aware of things and rearranging a little bit every day and bit by bit you form it. But the sense of this arrangement of harmonies is what I'm trying to describe. It's something so essential that as a pure idea, it does not have any form, but it's what holds together the energies. So th these are the three things, the field, the conditions and the arrangement of harmonies. Can you repeat that slower? I, I couldn't hear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, from seeing from the universe's viewpoint. Okay. So let's say you are now going to do some work, and why are you doing it? Uh, because it serves me. It's convenient for me. I will benefit, or I'm helping somebody. Why are you doing that? Because it makes me happy to help them. It makes me feel important. It makes me feel useful. Whatever the form and I'm not putting a judgment to it, whatever the reason. It's still you-centric, even when you're doing it for someone else. But if you look at, as if you're standing above both me and this person or this group, my life, their life, others' lives, I stand above and I see them all as equal from the perspective of the universe looking at them, including this fellow who is one of them, okay? And then I look at what needs to be done, and it's a very objective perspective, very uh, inclusive, even a universal viewpoint that says, ah, this needs to happen. And you look at it and you say, oh yes, okay, and you do it. There's no sense of I am doing it to help them or because I feel good or the I kind of fades out. It becomes a much more selfless or non-egocentric perspective. So it's an interesting exercise and you begin to understand so many things you did, you could do differently. The action may remain the same at the end of the day, but you'll no more be doing it for yourself. In the state of consciousness itself changes. And you begin to look at everything you do in life from a perspective which is much more complete and more true, less egocentric. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned Conceptualize the mental plane, mm -hmm. impact life force, mm -hmm. materializes. You said sometimes you think of something and you change your mind and you think of something that's sort of conflicting to the first one. Right. And the first one comes out, so <laughs> this time materialization or a flawed one. Yes. Flawed one. So it seems kind of scary. So, how do you cancel the first one? <laughs> yes. One? So, the, the way, of course, is not to fixate on your idea too strongly to begin with. If you create an idea, necessarily it will be full of your prejudices, your habits, your limitations and everything else which limits. Instead, you try to feel from above, from a higher poise, higher perspective, what's the ideal, most complete. So something which is more encompassing, more flexible, more inclusive even as an idea, to the best that you can. But even there, you start with something which is broad enough and open to still higher insights from the beginning. Instead of I am thinking and deciding, I have a direction, I have a certain intention, I feel and I open myself and even my ideation to a higher influence or insight. So I don't want to use a more um, specific form that says, what does the divine want me to do? Then it's still my idea of what the divine wants that warps it. Rather, I start with what do I know which is the best and most inclusive, but then I open it to something still higher, more inclusive. 
And increasingly, if you have developed this sense of opening to receive, then you'll find into the mold of your idea, things begin to fill and bit by bit it opens out, becomes more correct and aligns. And although I started with it like this, after a while it kind of shaped itself from that influence to become more true. And you feel the quality, yes, this is more true, more, that, that sensitivity has to develop. And then as you go along, the outcome again is in the particular form is not fixed. Even the divine um, inspiration comes at a more essential level and has to work out according to the conditions and the arrangement of the receptive forces. So considering that right now finances are limited, out of this ideal conception, we do only a skeletal structure of it. And then in time the skeleton will fill. And so there's a kind of a sequencing and even modifying according to technology, evolving, and so on. Yes. So, if we look from the universal perspective for action, then we may not end up doing the same action. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Some place is little scary because they want to do something very self centric, like going for a movie. And I look at bigger picture and say, hey, at what place this is clean up or home, this is grandma, this is where your energy is at the spent. So, will it always be a case that, like, so there's a little resistance from the little eye that, yes. like, hey, I may disappear in this process? Yes. So, the sense of I will disappear in this process. But it will be not that your I will be uh, suppressed, rather the narrowness of the I will be freed. Or the sense will be the I is freed into its own wider and deeper truth. So, when you begin to see from the universal perspective, you want to go for a movie, certain days it will be obvious that today is not the day for the movie. Today that thing is more important, more urgent even, more necessary. And then there will be other days when it will be obvious, today I will go to the movie because this is more valuable. But it will not be because I want, it will be because it's the right thing. You see, so the sense of I will begin to thin very quickly and you need not fear that. It's rather the limits of I, the narrowness of I which begin to thin out and you open out to an embracing I, more inclusive. It's still fulfilling your need. There will be days when you will have that delicious food because that's the right thing also to enjoy it and to be able to enjoy it truly. You can best enjoy when you're free from your little I. As long as you're in a narrow eye, your enjoyment is also compromised because it tries, it is always afraid of losing the enjoyment or it overdoes the enjoyment, the right balance is always lost. So you end up being sick from it or you, somehow it is compromised. In the wider consciousness, you have true enjoyment and no attachment. But let it happen bit by bit. Start the process and trust that it will lead you. And if you are afraid, well, experiment. Try it out once, see where it goes, and find your safe space and bit by bit let the boundaries dissolve. Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, very important. When the ego is uh, dissolved, he says, it's not that consciousness is lost. It is the boundaries of consciousness which are removed. So your consciousness actually grows and becomes more complete and therefore more true. It is more false when it is narrow and limited and bound. And you actually experience that your life is more expressive of yourself when it's freed from the narrow ego. Mm -hmm. Of 
course, of course. So in any case, in the beginning when you start, it will be your perspective, your conception of how the universe looks at it. But what happens is, in the very act of turning to a higher poise, and you open out to higher influence also. And bit by bit, a more true perspective begins to fill your now more opened mind. And so it's okay, even if it starts with the formation, uh, you allow your mind to remain open to something still higher and deeper to fill, and the perspective rapidly widens and deepens. And there's a point where you actually begin to live in a consciousness which is more universal. And it changes everything after that. So it's okay for your mind to take a stance where it's still a formation. But the formation in this particular case necessarily thins out because it's opening to something so wide. The moment the drop approaches the ocean, it begins to feel its narrowness and littleness and begins to yield to the vastness of the ocean. Ocean begins to touch drop and fill it. And after that there's no more. Whatever formation you started very quickly breaks up and something true fills. Of course, this prepares the way for the self and the influence of the self to fill. And equally from a poise within the presence of the soul's uh, influence can begin to fill. But the practice is primarily intended in this context to widen the mind's perspective and prepare it to receive these deeper um, states of consciousness. So we'll pause here. The text itself is fascinating. And we have a perspective now of three domains which are so different. The physical, the vital, the mental, each having its own laws, its own quality of consciousness, its own beings even, and then a complex mix across these three. Not only which forms the universe, but within us, these three levels. And the full scope of this we will complete next uh, Friday. And then into this he will bring in the spiritual influence. And that's where we will truly understand how these three themselves are a special expression of the spiritual consciousness. And because they are originating from the spiritual, each has a spiritual essentiality which justifies it and which fulfills and gives to it its true place in the overall scheme. Otherwise, the three being so different, they are always in conflict with each other. Neither of these three can become truly the leader around which all three can work together. Mind being more conscious must lead necessarily because we are mental beings but the heart never follows. The emotions and the vital energies do not yield to the mind. Matter does not yield. But as best as we can, that's the, Sri Aurobindo uses the word, vice regent. In the absence of the psychic being, the true soul, which can take all three into itself and all three can harmonize around it. So it, so to say, projects the rational intellectual poise temporarily as the center around which to organize the personality. But now this poise has to turn to the deeper true person within and let it take charge. So all that will be following uh, subsequently. We can close with an Om. Oh.